welcome to the Massachusetts Historical Society's Conrad E. Wright Research Conference. This is the fourth day of our program. My name is Candace Horn, Wall Street Channel. I. I'm going to turn to introductions. Our first presenter today is Corinne Field. She is Associate Professor of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at the University of Virginia. She is the author of The Struggle for Equal Adulthood, Gender, Race, Age, and the Fight for Citizenship in Antebellum America. She co-edited Age in America, Colonial Era to the Present, and a roundtable for the American Historical Review on Age as a Useful Category of Historical Analysis. Her current book project is tentatively titled Grand Old Women, How Abolitionists and Feminists Transform Aging in America. It is a collective biography of leading women's rights activists who grew up old in public during the 19th century. Women such as Sojourner Truth, Lucretia Mott, Frances Harper, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony attained their greatest influence after age 50 and remained active into their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Field's research explains how these women pushed back against stigma that we would now call ageism, how they theorized the intersections of age, race, and class in women's lives, and how their persistent activism opened new possibilities for women's security and fulfillment in old age. Field is co-founder of the History of Black Girlhood Network, an informal collaboration of scholars working to promote research into the historical experience of black girls and she was a co-organizer of the Global History of Black Girlhood Conference held at UVA in April of 2017. She has served as a chair of the Aging and Ageism Caucus of the National Women's Studies Association. Field has been a fellow at, Rad at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, Harvard University, the Schlesinger Library, the American Antiquarian Society, the Huntington Library, and the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. Professor Field, welcome to the MHS. Well, um, thank you, Kid, for that introduction and everyone at the Massachusetts Historical Society and the other presenters for such a great conference. This has been really interesting. I also want to specifically thank Allison Lang for comments on an earlier version of this paper and the American Antiquarian Society for supporting this research. Um, I am going to share my screen with you. Um, so as... Kit said, I am all about age, and today I want to talk to you about how women's rights activists and abolitionists tried to turn the ridicule of old women into respect. Uh, this is very much a work in progress, actually, and I really urge you to submit your comments to the Q&A and um, also to email me after the presentation. So, um, oh dear, my slide is not it okay there we go so um the theme for this panel is is she disqualified from voting what i want to argue is that negative attitudes towards women's oldness presented a major barrier to women's political participation not just voting but to claiming public authority and respect as national leaders when women organized to end slavery and demand their rights, critics dismissed them as ugly old maids and foolish old women. By ridiculing both old maids and old women as no longer young, no longer desirable, no longer pleasing to men, conservative commentators turned oldness for women into a form of stigma that could be applied to unmarried women over 30, matrons in their 50s, or widows in their 60s. We might think of this as misogynistic oldness, oldness not as a stage of life, but oldness as a means of denigrating women. Anti-blackness also shaped the cultural stigma of the category old women by exposing black women to particular forms of ridicule that were not faced by white women. Now, neither the 15th nor the 19th Amendments, with their abstract language of race and sex, address these age-based dynamics. To win respect as national leaders, women would have to change how Americans thought about aging itself. And this is precisely what they tried to do. At the first National Women's Rights Convention held in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1850, Lucretia Mott, age 57, was the most famous woman to speak. 
As Carol Faulkner shows in her wonderful biography, Mott was a radical egalitarian, fighting for liberty and equality for all. What interests me is that she used her speech to focus attention on age as a vector of power, arguing that the ridicule of older women blocked all kinds of reform. Mott said, an old woman is simply an object of ridicule, and anything that is ridiculous or foolish is said to be only fit for an old woman. Now, Mott is theorizing this category old woman in two distinct ways. So first, she argues that old woman functioned as a tool for ridicule that um, was an aesthetic judgment that could be applied to women who were no longer young. So if you saw um, Jessica Delveth's paper on woman suffrage and marriage a few days ago, I want you to think of those anti-suffrage postcards from the 1910s that presented women as ugly old maids or domineering harridans. Um, this is what Mott's thinking about in, in this first part of her analysis. Um, she's already seeing this in 1850. But Mott also theorized a second form of ridicule that I think is even more interesting um, by saying anything that is ridiculous or foolish is said to be only fit for an old woman. So here the category old woman functioned as a sort of free-floating signifier severed from its connection to female bodies and deployed to trivialize things, movements, and ideas. So to understand this second function of old woman, we can look to the anti-abolitionist New York Herald. So the Herald dismissed the Worcester Convention as, quote, that incantation of old women, the infidel abolitionists and fugitive slaves, and as a, quote, motley gathering of old grannies, male and female. So through gender and age inversion, the Herald portrayed white abolitionist men in the prime of life, such as William Lloyd Garrison, age 44, and Wendell Phillips, age 38, as both feminine and superannuated, while also cleaving off blackness as a category of property, not persons, fugitive slaves undifferentiated by gender or age. Several black women sat on the platform at the Worcester Convention, but only Sojourner Truth spoke at length. Truth was Mott's age peer, born just a few years later, and also a grandmother. But Bennett's Herald erased her age by calling her Dinah, a generic term for a black servant. In her narrative, which she published that year and sold during breaks in the convention, Truth testified about black women's struggles to age with dignity, both in her own life and in her mother's life before her. Mott quoted Truth in her closing remarks at the convention, thus recognizing her age peer as an influential leader worthy of respect. James Gordon Bennett, the editor of the New York Herald, was only two years younger than Mott and about the same age as Truth. So when his paper described Mott as, quote, an elderly lady, all bone, gristle, and resolution, he was actually writing about an age peer. Middle age could enhance the appeal of men as political leaders in the mid-19th century. So in 1850, the average age of congressmen was 43, of senators 50, and of governors 57. The Constitution required that candidates for president be over 35, but most had been mo much older than that. In the most recent election, Zachary Taylor was 64 when he was inaugurated. So Bennett didn't ridicule Mott because she was in her 50s, but because she was a woman in her 50s. So much of this ridicule targeted at older women, both black and white, centered on what they looked like. So visual culture offers vivid examples of the negative tropes used to ridicule women who were no longer young. So take, for example, this lithograph by William Edwards Clay from 1839. This is an example of the anti-amalgamation discourse that Carol Faulkner analyzed in her paper on Tuesday. But it's also an attack on anti-slavery women's supposed violations of age-based norms for white women's behavior. In Clay's hands, the members of the Lynn Female Anti-Slavery Society, who had been gathering petitions to demand the Massachusetts legislature repeal racially discriminatory laws, 
They become not serious political lobbyists, but ridiculous old coquettes, pushing ahead of younger white women to gain the attention of a viciously caricatured black man. Johnny Q, the former president John Adams, stands at the center of the picture, violating racial barriers, but not out of place because of his age. Black women, young or old, disappear from this satire entirely. So Clay dedicated this print to Caroline Augusta Chase. Her real name was Aeroline. She was an unmarried white woman and thus an old maid, but she was only 32 years old. So as I show in my longer paper, this tactic of exaggerating and ridiculing the age of white women had roots in Georgian caricature of the 18th century. Images of ugly old maids, ridiculous old coquettes, and foolish old women were central to the visual vocabulary of Anglo-American satire and functioned to undercut the potential authority of educated, often property-owning white women. American artists applied these established visual tropes to abolitionists and women's rights activists. These satires show an acute awareness of age as a vector of power. So this image, Bloomer and Bloomerism in Practice by Adam Weingartner, was a response to the early women's rights conventions in the 1850s. It shows a middle-aged white matron, Mrs. Turkey, daydreaming of a banner that reads, For President, Mrs. Turkey, while her husband, looking like an overworked old woman, wears a bonnet and hunches over his sewing in a rocking chair. Two young servant women, black and white, burst through the door wearing bloomers and holding banners. So in this upside down world, a white wife has been enhanced by age, her husband diminished, and young working class women have united across race to demand a voice in political culture. When caricaturists wanted to ridicule male politicians, they didn't exaggerate their wrinkles or gray hair, but instead dressed them in bonnets and called them old women. So in this satirical lithograph from 1840, Henry Harrison appears as an overly excitable old scholarly maid. Clara de Kitchen, the title of the image, was a blackface minstrel song. So this image links misogynistic ageism and anti-blackness to poke fun at Harrison. I want you to notice that his opponents also look old. They've got receding hairlines or portly bellies, but they're old men not old women. Now, images of black women are very rare in this period of, I mean, of old black women, specifically old black women. So caricaturists such as William Clay pictured black women as always already not beautiful when young and thus unable to lose their beauty with age. So I want you to look, for example, at the satirical print of a wedding feast by the British artist William Summers, who'd been influenced by Clay. The two women that sit at the center of the picture are recognizable as um, one young because she's the bride and the other old because of her spectacle and bonnet, but they have practically the same features. So when Summers portrayed a young black bride as not beautiful and not desirable in his eyes, he also rendered her mother as illegible within the visual tropes of old white womanhood as no longer pleasing to men. When white audiences did focus on black women's oldness, it was as a form of freakery and entertainment. In 1835, P.T. Barnum exhibited Joyce Heff, an enslaved woman from Kentucky, advertising her as the 161-year-old wet nurse of George Washington. In the 1870s and 1880s, when Sojourner Truth became the most well-known Black women's rights activist, she faced persistent comparisons to Heff and questions as to whether she had nursed George Washington as well. So with this cultural background in mind, we can see the images produced by women's rights activists as efforts to change how Americans saw mature women. So as Alison Lang points out, women's suffragists use portraits as politics. What interests me is how these women pose themselves as specifically middle-aged and old women, innovating new ways of showing what mature women with political power looked like. 
So this engraving of Mott was based on an oil painting from 1842, the year Mott turned 49. And it was one of the first portraits of a women's rights activist to circulate widely in public. Details marked Mott as no longer young, so their deep creases that set off her eyes and mouth and her cheeks have begun to hollow out, her chin to sag a little. But she appeared self-respecting, calm, and resolute, a portrait of persistence in the anti-slavery cause. Truth adopted a similar self-presentation when she posed for photographs in the 1860s. Like Mott, she wore a simple Quaker style of dress, white caps and shawls, and posed with a determined resilience. Truth's ability to control her own image with her famous caption, I sell the shadow to support the substance, pushed back on the idea that she was another Joyce Heth entertaining the public. Mott and Truth posed repeatedly for photographs after the Civil War, documenting how they aged into their 70s and 80s. By adopting a nearly identical self-presentation, they both pushed back against the ridicule of old women as coquettes, fools, or freaks, creating an interracial vocabulary for presenting old women as dignified leaders. Both became icons of older womanhood, and interestingly, their images remained in the public eye even after their deaths in the early 1880s. So I want to jump ahead to 1893, when at the World's Columbian Exhibition in Chicago, the program for the Department of the National American Woman Suffrage Association turned Ma into a founding foremother from whom Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucy Stone, and Susan B. Anthony descended in orders of seniority. So this program clearly presented old white women as the face of the women's suffrage movement, with middle-aged leaders growing into the role of political elder innovated by Mott. Sojourner Truth also made a posthumous appearance at the World's Fair, Truth's white collaborator, Francis Titus, commissioned a portrait of Truth meeting with President Abraham Lincoln in 1864 and sent this painting to the Michigan Pavilion in Chicago. This image, with both their faces lined by care, placed Truth in the same frame of mature political leadership as a beloved president. But if we turn to the broader cultural context of the fair, we can see how misogynistic and anti-Black attitudes towards women's oldness remained powerful barriers to public respect. The Republican newspaper, The Daily Interocean, ran very flattering accounts of older women's speeches at the fair, but also printed a series of advertisements for anti-aging products that explicitly targeted white women's fears of growing older. So, for example, Mademoiselle M. Yale pitched her wrinkle cure with the claim that she was 40, but looked as fresh and lovely as any young beauty of 18. Her ad warned in the harshest possible language, quote, the world has no use for an old or faded woman. You are valued by your age and appearance. So by this logic, there was no use for the leaders of Nassau with their wrinkled faces and gray hair. So also at the fair, the Aunt Jemima Manufacturing Company paid Nancy Green, a middle-aged black woman who had been enslaved in Kentucky, to cook pancakes for white visitors, creating an advertising icon that would shape how white people regarded middle-aged black women. So truth might be linked to Lincoln, but older Black women in general remained perpetual servants in popular advertising imagery. By the 1910s, many white suffragists simply gave up on trying to convince Americans to respect older women or to recognize Black women as leaders who helped build the movement. Instead, they exploited the techniques of modern advertising to present political women as young, beautiful, and overwhelmingly white. This strategy helped pass the 19th Amendment, but it did little to convince Americans that older women, white or black, should be recognized as competent political leaders. 
Perhaps more profoundly, women suffragists investment in youth as the vanguard of women's progress, cut women off from their own futures, encouraging women to try to look and act young instead of embracing the process of growing older. In this sense, I think we can see the 19th Amendment as both a victory and a defeat for women in politics. Women as voters did not translate into women being voted for. Leadership remained contested in part, I think, because of these negative attitudes towards older women that continued to circulate so powerfully in popular culture. Thank you so much, and I look forward to your comments. Thank you very much, Professor Field. All right, and now to the American Civil War. I'm going back a little bit in time. Our second presenter is Professor Nicole Etchison. She is Alexander M. Bracken, Professor of History at Ball State University. She is the author of various books, including uh, Bleeding Kansas, The Emerging Midwest, and her book, A Generation at War, The Civil War Era in a Northern Community, won the 2012 Avery O. Craven Award from the Organization of American Historians for the most original book on the coming of the Civil War, the Civil War era or Reconstruction, uh, accepting works of uh, purely military history. She is currently working on a project about suffrage in the post-Civil War era. Well, thanks to Kid for that kind introduction and to Kid and Katie for everything they've done organizing this, this conference, which has I assume then a tremendous amount of work and to the Massachusetts Historical Society for hosting it and, and uh, hosting it during these difficult times. Um, Alexander Kazar in his book, The Right to Vote, which is really the definitive history of voting in the United States, makes the overall point that wars are periods when suffrage rights are advanced. And this was certainly true for African-American men during the Civil War period. Historians of women's suffrage, however, as uh, Ellen Du Bois talked about in the first session, note that white and uh, black male abolitionists declared the Civil War to be the Negro's hour and excluded women from suffrage, fearing that adding women's suffrage uh, would torpedo the efforts to get black men to vote. And uh, Faye Dudden, in a, a recent and I think very important book, uh, has shown ha exactly how people like Wendell Phillips went about undermining women's suffrage in the post-Civil War era. I want, however, this afternoon to call into question the very premise that the Civil War was a period when there was an opening where women could have gotten the vote as well as black men. To make this argument, I want to start with the pre-Civil War period. I think it's important to remember that although black male suffrage rights were under attack in the antebellum period, still the bottom line was that black men had the vote in certain states, uh, white women, and black women nowhere had the right to vote. No state in the pre-Civil War granted women suffrage rights. Uh, it's also the case that black men and white women made many of the same claims in the antebellum period to why they should have the vote. And among these claims was a natural rights claim that uh, those who were taxed should have the right of representation and that women uh, and black men were taxed, but they were not represented. Um, Corinne Field in her paper just now referred to Lucy Stone. Lucy Stone refused uh, at one point famously to pay her property taxes and had some of her possessions off, uh, auctioned off. Uh, black men and white women also made the argument that they were native-born, loyal United States citizens who were denied the vote at a time when immigrants could uh, get the vote even before they were naturalized. And this was discussed at, at the session yesterday. Um, and uh, women and black men 
said that you had people coming from Ireland or Germany who may not understand Republican institutions because they came from monarchical governments, but nonetheless, they, they could vote in certain states. And black men made the argument in the antebellum period that they and their ancestors had fought in every American war. And they would cite Crispus Attucks in the American Revolution and uh, the free blacks of New Orleans who had fought under Andrew Jackson at the War of 1812. The Civil War privileged suffrage claims that were based on loyalty and military service in a way that black men were able to exploit, but white women were not. The Civil War made loyalty very important to any argument for suffrage. A petition from Georgia Freedmen in 1865 said, we are loyal, always have been loyal, and always will remain loyal. And in order to make our loyalty most effective in the service of the government, we humbly petition to be allowed to exercise the right of suffrage. White women, northern white women, also sought to express loyalty to the government. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony famously stopped campaigning for women's suffrage and women's rights, formed the Women's National Loyal League to campaign for uh, in, uh, emancipation of African Americans, and uh, believed that in some way this would advance by advancing black rights, they would also be able to advance white women's rights or women's rights. Um, but the problem with this is that women as a whole could not be counted on to be monolithically loyal in the same sense that African-American men would be. Uh, enfranchising women would mean enfranchising white women who were Democrats or, or who were uh, pro-Confederate. Southern women, white women might be, would be voting. The second element, military service, that the Civil War made very important. Frederick Douglass said in 1864 that black men had fully earned the elective franchise through their military service. And every appeal for black male suffrage made in the Civil War period is going to tell you that 200,000 black men served in the Union Army. Susan B. Anthony says during the war that women could neither take the ballot nor the bullet to settle this question of slavery. So women are quite frank that they are not doing military service in the same way that black men do. It's not until 1870 that white women begin to say we did military service. Uh, eight, in 1870, Mary Livermore rebuked men who said, when women do military service, they shall vote. We did do military duty, Livermore insisted. I could tell you of women who have died from exposure and suffering in the war and whose graves can be found at Milliken's Bend and at other places throughout the country. In addition to being kind of tardy in saying that they did military service during the war, um, women also faced the barriers to their enfranchisement that the Civil War threw up. The 14th Amendment linked voting and repre representation to male citizens, putting the word male in the Constitution for the first time. The 15th Amendment, as we know, forbade denying the right to vote on the basis of race, but not of gender. So to get around the 14th and 15th Amendments, Missouri suffrages Francis and Virginia Minor claimed that the amendments had made voting a right of citizenship and no one denies women are citizens. So women were already legally enfranchised uh, in what they called the new departure. And the Supreme Court struck that down saying, yes, women are definitely citizens, but no one has ever said that voting is a right of citizenship. So the women's movement entered a long period called the doldrums of decades long grueling efforts to gain the vote e either through a constitutional amendment, um, the so-called Anthony Amendment, or through state laws and amendments. This involved an estimated 500 campaigns in 33 states. 
which were mostly successful in the West. Wyoming adopts women's suffrage in its territorial period. Colorado, Idaho, and Utah adopt women's suffrage uh, in the 1890s. The 1890s are a crucial decade also because this is when we see the disfranchisement of African-American men that occurs in the South. Disfranchisement of black men had important consequences for women's suffrage. White Southerners were loath to reopen the suffrage issue by expanding women's rights to vote. Even white Southern suffragists, women suffragists such as Kate Gordon in Louisiana and Laura Clay in Kentucky opposed achieving women suffrage by a, an amendment to the US Constitution. They wanted to be enfranchised by their states because a federal amendment was how black men had gained the vote, and this was anathema in the South. In 1916, however, Carrie Chapman Catt presented the National American Woman Suffrage Association with what she called her winning plan, saying now this is the woman's hour, uh, prioritizing a federal amendment. The Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi Daily Clarion Ledger condemned what would be the 19th Amendment as the Susan B. Anthony, Fred Douglas, Linda Phillips, Tad Stevens Amendment to the Federal Constitution, which would enfranchise a million Negro women to vote the Republican ticket. This is the most damnable scheme ever hatched by a lot of Yankee abolitionists, free lovers, social equality advocates, South haters who believe in the intermarriage of the races and that a Negro woman is as good as a white woman. So you can see what Kat and NASA were up against. And we know that Kat pandered, along with other white women suffragists, to this racism. Kat often told Southern opponents of woman suffrage that they would keep black women disfranchised exactly the way they kept black men disfranchised with poll taxes and literacy tests. Uh, it should be noted African Americans were generally supportive of woman suffrage because anything that reopened the suffrage issue seemed like an advance. An editorial in the crisis, the organ, excuse me, of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People said, every argument for Negro suffrage is an argument for woman suffrage. Every argument for woman suffrage is an argument for Negro suffrage. World War I, as we know, is the crucial final stage. Rather than suspend the woman's movement, as Kat was urged to do, and as Anthony and Stanton had done during the Civil War, uh, Kat threw suffragists into war work and constantly reminded President Woodrow Wilson that, it, that women should be enfranchised as a war measure, which would enable our women to throw more full and wholeheartedly their entire energy into work for their country and for humanity instead of for their own liberty and independence. And Wilson gradually agreed. And of course, as a politician, Wilson realized that woman suffrage was gaining more ground in the states and that it was becoming dangerous to stand against it. But he did support the 19th Amendment. And what followed, of course, was a, a grueling ratification process that I, I won't um, talk much about here, but I do like Kat's letter to Alice Stone Blackwell after ratification succeeded. I am sure no one would ever believe how much work each one of these miserable states have caused us. The ratification seemed to come in such a spontaneous way, but I beg to assure you that there is nothing spontaneous about them. I don't want to give a simplistic explanation for the success of woman suffrage in 1920. It's a very complex issue, as we all know. What my point is, is to suggest that in the immediate post-Civil War years, Northern white women were unable to turn their loyalty and their services, nurses and sanitary commission workers and teachers of the freedmen into successful arguments for the vote. While African American men were able to turn their loyalty and their service in the army into a successful argument for the vote. And also, I believe that rather than opening 
a path for women to achieve the suffrage, the Civil War threw up obstacles to women's suffrage by placing the word male in the Constitution and by solidifying white Southern opposition to any federal amendment that would upset disfranchisement of African Americans. In World War I, however, the suffragists were successful in linking their loyalty and Civil War service to the right to vote and they succeeded despite the obstacles the Civil War had created for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Etchison. And now to Professor Rabia Belt. She's an Associate Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. She's a legal historian whose scholarship focuses on disability and citizenship. Her scholarship ranges from cultural analysis of disability in media to contemporary issues facing voters with disability to the historical treatment of disabled Americans. She's currently writing a book titled Disabling Democracy in America, Disability, Citizenship, Suffrage, and the Law, 1819 to 1920. Professor Belt is also an advocate for people with disabilities. In 2016, President Obama named her as a council member to the National Council on Disability, the independent federal agency that advises the president, Congress, and other federal agencies regarding policies and practices that affect people with disabilities. Professor Belt, welcome to the MHS. Thank you so much. Greetings from the West Coast. Thank you so much for having me here. And thank you to Kit and Katie for all of your wonderful organizational skill um, in bringing us together for this presentation and symposium. So thank you so much for coming to my talk. Um, and I want to say in particular too that I really appreciate the fact that the Massachusetts Historical Society is celebrating the anniversary of both the 19th Amendment and the 15th Amendment. We've seen, I think, a lot over this year um, having to do with the 19th Amendment, but the conversation about the 15th Amendment has been far more muted. Um, I am going, though, to talk mostly about the 19th Amendment, or at least the campaign for women's suffrage in my paper. Um, so these amendments are big milestones in U.S. history, and like all milestones, it's complicated. Um, and my paper speaks to part of that complication. And let me share my screen with you. Um, So as was said, this is, um, I'm working on a book project having to do with um, uh, how mental disability and ideas about mental competency have shaped the development of voting rights. And um, the anchor of that uh, book is about how folks um, that were designated by their mental status were disenfranchised, but then also how um, activists who were part of those groups that were disenfranchised tried to leverage their way in. And this chapter is an example of that with respect to women's suffrage. And I just wanna to note too, I did not forget about black people. So there is another chapter having to do with black activism and I'm happy to um, have a conversation about that during the Q&A. And I'd also like to say that I am going to use terms that I hope are offensive to everyone that are lis listening to this. So my um, goal is certainly not to offend, but to use the historical terms that my actors did. So lunacy or insanity roughly corresponds to what we talk about now as psychiatric or mental impairments. Idiocy or feeble-mindedness roughly corresponds to uh, what we talk about now with respect to intellectual or developmental impairments. So, um, I'm going to start in 1893 with Kansas suffragist Henrietta Briggs Wall, who commissioned a painting for the World's Fair in Chicago, which Kara just talked about, and I think our papers fit well together. Um, and this painting was entitled American Woman and Her Political Peers, and a contemporary newspaper article described it as such. 
In the center of the frame is the portrait of an intelligent looking middle-aged American lady. So note the uh, key to age, as Corey Field pointed out, whose mouth and chin are indicative of great firmness, firmness of purpose. And this image depicted prominent suffragist Frances Willard and surrounding her were an array of men, including an Indian, a convict, and quote, a hopeless idiot with a low retreating brow and exposing his fang-like teeth in an imbecile grin, and a raving maniac peering out from the picture with staring orbs and tussled hair, end quote. And Briggswell observed the next year that strikes the women every time. They do not realize they wear a class with idiots, criminals, and the insane as they do when they see that picture. Shocking? Well, it takes a shock to arouse some people to a sense of injustice and degradation, end quote. And she hoped that this painting would perform the same function for women's suffrage that Uncle Tom's Cabot did for slavery, spur a political movement based on moral outrage. So painting did not tr trigger a war, but it did catalyze a strong emotional reaction on those who saw it. And the focus of in this indignation was directed at the juxtaposition of images that this dignified, intelligent, middle-aged white woman was disenfranchised along with disreputable and mentally incompetent men was intended to create outrage. And the painting quickly became a symbol of the political struggle that white women faced at the end of the 19th century. And the audience that saw it at the World's Fair was augmented by the numerous reproductions and displays that followed. And historians of the suffrage movement have noted it as part of the penetration of the suffrage movement into the political and cultural consciousness of the time. But what's less remarked upon are the images themselves. Some folks have talked about the figure of the Indian and the linkage between suffrage and race, but there's a curious silence that surrounds the figures of the lunatic and the idiot. Why would Briggswell believe that these images of mental incapacity were relevant to women's suffrage? Um, and this is far from an aberration in this preoccupation with mental incapacity and women's suffrage. Um, and I draw on a diverse array of sources to talk about this deep involvement. Um, as a way to move from a disenfranchised outgroup to an enfranchised in-group, elite white women suffrage activists use mental disability to leverage their racial privilege in order to gain the franchise. And they countered images and ideas of female lunatics and men female mental weakness deployed by anti-suffragists homogenized the idea of white women as able-minded and offered these able-minded white women as potential allies with able-minded white men who would act as a bulwark against a potential menace of enfranchised mentally impaired men. And to be sure, I am not claiming that all suffrage activists did this. It's not all suffrage activists. This is a subset of activists, almost entirely ones that are elite in white. Um, However, I have not been able to find discussion by other activists who directly contested the strategic use of lunatics and idiots and suffrage activism. So I'm going to outline a few aspects of the strategy for the activists that did employ it. So um, as Kara Swanson mentioned, um, a key challenge that women's suffrage just had to overcome was that women were properly classed with lunatics and idiots as outcasts from the vote because they were mentally deficient to men. Um, that these activists used lunatics and idiots as a foil to change the terms of the debate, um, that they did not have to prove that they were equal mentally to the typical white man, just that they were more mentally competent than lunatics and idiots. And there's a series of strategies that they went through in order to do that. So I can't go through all of them here. Um, we can talk more in the Q&A about any of the other ones. So one thing they did um, was to counter the mental spectrum installed by law with one of their own. So numerous activists use phrases such as insane, idiots, convicts, as women as damning indictments of the assemblage of people unable to vote. 
And the point was not to catalyze a movement to enfranchise all members of this disenfranchised assemblage, but to point out the incongruity of linking white women with these otherwise disreputable and incompetent men. And in all the variations of this taxonomy, lunatics and idiots played a prominent role. And taxonomies of mental fitness became an important part of this political strategy. And they constructed a moral and mental hierarchy with idiots and insane men on the bottom. And then they were followed by ignorant men right above them. So uh, suffragists often highlighted the ethnicity of the men they considered too ignorant to vote. And the Irish came in for a uh, particular scorn as Irish immigrants spilled into the United States after the potato famine, their ranks filled up benevolent institutions such as poorhouses and lunatic asylums. And reformers and alienists alike contended the Irish were particularly susceptible to pauperism, corruption, and insanity, and they pointed to institutional statistics to bolster their case. Um, and this is a political cartoon that was in Harper's Wheatley titled The Ignorant Boat. And here we have a incompetent black man from the South looking at an incompetent Irish man from the North, sort of these were the two problems of um, sort of these regions, but both of them are these mentally incompetent men um, that were sullying the vote. And uh, talking about these men, uh, they, women question why any of these men should receive the vote while they themselves who possess more mental acumen were disenfranchised. Um, so this capitalized on existing forms of discrimination against non-white men, white ethnic immigrants, and men defined wholly by their mental incompetency. And as you can probably tell from uh, like the political cartoons that Thomas Nast wrote was that uh, visual culture was an important part of um, shaping what people thought about both mental incompetency and also the vote. Um, and with suffrage strategies, it was particularly intense in the second half of the 19th century and early 20th century. So the painting I started out with was probably the most famous example. The activists propped up replicas of the poster and described it to listeners on the campaign field and in constitutional debates and in the halls of Congress. There were also political cartoons such as this one, um, uh, where a woman is sort of chained to an imbecile and a criminal and the title unfit for self-government. Um, there were posters such as this. Uh, they distributed postcards. This is uh, the cover of a campaign kit that was used for suffragists across the country. It says imbeciles, children, women, criminals. These are the disenfranchised. Uh, then compose songs and poems. I'm not going to sing this for you because uh, I don't want you all to flee Zoom right now. Um, but I will sort of point out this uh, sarcastic that this is sort of coined uh, according to sort of America, uh, sort of the standard song that uh, class me as well befits with males who lost their wits, felons and idiots class me with them. And they juxtaposed elegant images of elite white women that highlighted their intellectual pr prowess with grotesque caricatures of disreputable women. To transform the linkage of women with lunatics and idiots from a source of shame to a vehicle of outrage. And then there was also chivalrous disenfranchisement, talking about the use of benevolent sexism. So, since women were not voting, they had to persuade those who were men. And female enfranchisement was a tricky subject as it threatened to not only dilute white male power, but also male mental supremacy. Using mental disability as a strategy that manifested itself in different registers helped neutralize both of these issues. So um, these activists invoked male ideas of chivalry along with social stereotypes of white female purity to persuade white men that their identification with disreputable and mentally impaired men was an outrage. And this line of attack also reassured men that they were not like the lunatics and idiots who were painted as disreputable. So it shored up their own reputations and sense of able-mindedness. And it performed a sing similar function for white women 
who are consolidated into one elite, able-minded monolith for symbolic and strategic purposes. So men who took up this charge employed other men on the behalf of their women. So, so this is, for example, this is a very direct uh, sort of call to chivalry. Um, and here is another example from Susan B. Anthony. So the strategy posited men as honorable, reputable, and able-minded and chastised them for dishonoring women by denying them the franchise. It also allowed white, able-minded Anglo-Saxon men a way to justify enfranchising their white sisters, mothers, and daughters as allies in racial and mental purity without compromising their own mental superiority. The activists twinned together mental prowess and moral acumen. The men they targeted for criticism were not only mentally incompetent, they were also easily corruptible, and their dependence on others created the potential for political shenanigans. And they were abundant. So able-minded women then were needed to overcome their influence. This, in a sense, created what I think of as a lunatic menace, similar to the Negro menace or yellow peril identified by other scholars where activists argued that white political power was threatened by the large number of black or Chinese people who might vote. And thus white female voters were needed to reinforce white power. Here, white women would join with able-minded white men to be an army of the able-minded, respectable, and uncorrupted, that would dwarf the influence of the insane, ignorant, and idiotic. So adding white women to the electorate would not dilute white male power, but would instead increase white able-minded power against those that would threaten it. And the spectacle of the movement became the material for legislative action. Activists introduced petitions to state constitutional conventions and to Congress, advocating the disenfranchisement of lunatics, idiots, and convicts, while at the same time pushing for the enfranchisement of women. They po protested the entrance of states into the union with provisions that disenfranchised women along with felons, lunatics, and other objectionable classes. And then legislators and constitutional convention delegates then picked up this language for enactment. So the tactics that I talked about were not just spectacle and rhetoric in isolation, they were intended to change the law that kept women, lunatics, and idiots disqualified from political citizenship. We know in 1920, um, women were enfranchised with the vote. But still left out of the political community were those lunatics and idiots that were, who remained disenfranchised by state law and then 42 states. And this is the current map of disenfranchisement based on mental status. So the blue states are ones that disenfranchise based on mental competency, um, incompetency, and the ones in teal are states that still use the 19th century language, um, insanity, lunacy, or idiocy. So you note that still the majority of states disenfranchise based on mental status in some guys. So that these uh, suffrage activists utilize these tropes and tactics to subordinate lunatics, idiots, and other men is not evidence of their particular villainy, but instead evidence of the power and persuasiveness of stigma towards folks with mental disabilities within society that they harnessed and used for their own ends. So instead of testing the logic that disenfranchised people based on their mental status, women suffrage activists were an active part of creating and reinforcing the linkage between mental competency and voting that ensnared lunatics and idiots within its wake. They didn't challenge the assumption that political citizenship required mental fitness, but instead questioned whether they were classified correctly within that rubric. And they use the category of mental disability to position themselves as mentally fit political actors. The lunatic and the idiot became useful devices to highlight and set white women apart as enfranchisable. And mental status acted to stigmatize those racialized men who are also potentially enfranchisable. <laughs> 
So racial tropes and mental disability tropes were used together to demonstrate uh, the political position of white women above racial and mental others. It placed white women activists above some men in terms of respectability and mental status and elided more difficult comparisons with the typical Anglo-Saxon man that would place them lower in the social and mental hierarchy. Instead, these men became their allies in the bulwark of able-minded white people against those who would sully the franchise with their mental incompetency. So, thank you very much. All right, four excellent papers. And now to discuss them together, uh, we have uh, Professor Paula Austin. She is an assistant professor of history and African-American studies at Boston University. She writes and teaches about black visual culture, African-American and civil rights history, and facilitates faculty professional development on diversity, equity, and inclusion. She, has, uh, she was a contributing author to co uh, Colonize This, Young Women of Color on Today's Feminism, and co-editor of Teaching Black Lives Matter, a special issue in the journal Radical Teacher. She recently published her book, Coming of Age in Jim Crow, D.C., Navigating the Politics of Everyday Life. Professor Austin. Thank you to the Massachusetts Historical Society for hosting this great version of the conference, to Kit and Katie for all the work to put this together, and to the great panelists. I um, am very happy to have gotten an opportunity to um, to read these great papers uh, and hear these scholars present and um, my comments and observations will be brief so that we can get to the question and answer and the discussion portion. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see if I have any value added here. Um, so thank you first to uh, Corinne Field for a great uh, engagement with visual culture um, and uh, specifically around middle and elder aged women's work to deal with the misrepresentation and ultimate dismissal um, at the hands of misogynistic oldness, which um, is a, a term I love. Um, you took us through visual representations of pervasive um, understandings of racialized old woman tropes that already weapons were then mobilized against both uh, women and men. Um, and I was interested too in looking at the images at uh, how many of these caricatures also appeared masculinized in a, in a sort of grotesque way. And so maybe this is something we can talk about later. Um, but the other thing that you draw out is the ways that women like Lucretia Ma and uh, Sojourner Truth used uh, technological advancements in visual culture at the time to try to take control of uh, not just their um, own images, but also the ways in which these representations were sort of more their uh, true or truer identities. Um, then I want to also thank uh, Nicole Etchison, who asked us to look, uh, to think about the relationship between uh, perceived national military service and eventual support for the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Uh, the ways that suffrage activists were um, less successful at being able to fully frame their work in the Civil War as military um, and thus contributive uh, uh, patriotically uh, enough to make them eligible for a particular kind of citizenship that is um, being sort of officially defined at the moment by the 14th Amendment. But by the early 20th century in the World War I era, um, you also ask us to think about the more successful um, uh, ability or attempt at making this connection um, and I think one of the things I wondered was whether or not the work that women did in, um, in the World War I effort in munitions factories in the Red Cross, et cetera, might have been, um, and maybe this is something that, that, that you address, might have been more legible within the confines of a pretty narrow definition of military service. Um, rather than whether these women were more successful at making the claim, um, you know, the way in which uh, mobilizing and invoking things like loyalty, for example, does not necessarily mean that they will be taken to mean that by those uh, in power. But that kind of gets me to my overall thoughts, which, I, which I'll get to. Um, 
And then I sort of am switching the order, the order of um, Robbie Belt and, and Kara Swanson's because I thought when I read them, I kind of saw them, um, I saw uh, Kara Swanson as kind of building on some of the conceptual stuff that um, Professor Belt brings to us. So uh, Professor Belt brings into relief the relationships between stereotypes of mental abilities and lack thereof and gender and race. Um, in uh, your engagement with disability studies and the ways in which some white suffrage activists really attempted to counter assumptions about women's inherent mental incompetency, uh, specifically the ways that they mobilized pervasive ideas about racial identity, class and ethnicity and a burgeoning, I mean, this I also is, is incredibly um, important to me personally and kind of interesting to me personally, uh, the way they used a burgeoning professionalizing um, hierarchy of able-mindedness and its relationship to morality and, and um, moral discernment to separate themselves from, quote, lunatics and idiots and from, and from men of color, both indigenous and black. Uh, and then Kira Swanson, thank you for your paper, um, builds on on this on this conceptual framing on white women's ability on the attempt to fully claim able-mindedness and um, your work I think points us to the to the to the patent lists and uh, predominantly white women's attempts to include themselves in inventiveness um, I was uh, particularly struck about by the um, the use of uh, women inventors by the Women's Journal as evidence of white women's ability to be independent thinkers, which is an incredibly important uh, criteria. Um, so highlighting not only criteria for uh, enfranchisement, so highlighting not only their ability to support themselves and their families potentially, but also maybe more importantly, their eligibility for the franchise. Um, and I and really, it the the paper drew us into um, also the visual culture um, of expositions uh, in the with the women's pavilion exhibit of um, white women inventors handiwork. And of course, for all of them, I was incredibly interested in the um, use of visual culture and popular culture to think about some of these. Um, big ideas, underlining idea, ideas, um, and the way that visual culture was harnessed and mobilized to combat these controlling images all around, but also to prevent, to present alternative images. So in this way, um, I thought that all the work really highlighted the structural and ideological realities in place against um, white women, young and old, and black women and men, um, and ideas that include the parameters of independent thinking, uh, sustainability, independent sustainability as criteria for self-government -govern and the franchise, gender, age representation based in emerging and evolving social and biological sciences, uh, bringing together anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism, misogyny, nativism, ableism, ageism. It was a lot, it was a lot of stuff. Um, and the ways that those ideas provide um, fundamental support and were necessary to hold in place the limitations to democratized political engagement really for a long time. Um, I appreciated the ways in which the work necessarily problematized the par parameters of fitness for self-governance and, and thus fitness uh, for the franchise. Uh, something I think about as I write about young people as political activists who are deemed outside um, of and not fit for the franchise either. And parenthetically, I will also say that I really appreciated the little bit of inside baseball that identified um, some of the internal debates and disagreements um, amongst activists, uh, which is sort of my favorite part of um, looking at social movement history because so many um, of my students, uh, for example, have a kind of flattened narrative about successful or unsuccessful movements. Um, and I think the realities of 
the coexistence of common goals and internal philosophical and strategic debates is, is really important to this. So um, I, think, I think where I'll kind of uh, end is um, thinking about our, our contemporary uh, social movement that we're inside of and the, and the lead up to it that's inclusive of the Me Too movement, of the Occupy movement, um, of the current um, defund the police movement. I think what all of this work really drew out for me is this long history of attempts to essentially get seats at a uh, sort of white supremacist, misogynist, capitalist, imperialist, ableist, fascist, maybe even table, um, and the work that um, that radical activists in some in some cases uh, did to counter pervasive stereotypes in representation ideologies, um, and and thus the ways that these manifested in policy, not just practice, uh, is is sort of the justice work that that we bring forward, but. I think I uh, ended kind of where, where Rabia left us, which is that activists, and to some extent, this is across the, per the spectrum, um, although I, I would be interested in hearing, um, Corey, you talk about this in thinking about the middle and elder aged uh, women's and their own self presentation, but I sort of am left um, with this question about, about the ways in which activists ultimately did not uh, always challenge pervasive ideological underpinnings that linked politi political citizenship and the rights therein to particular definitions of mental fitness, dexterity, physical beauty, gender identity, intellectual capacity, racial identity, but you know, rather work to get themselves kind of included in particular ways and reclassified sort of at the expense of, of other folks. So no real dismantling happening here. Um, and this is what uh, I think, you know, in looking at a kind of long um, struggle for uh, for social and political equality in, the, in those movements, um, my students often disdainfully call uh, this respectability politics. But I'm, I'm willing to take pushback on this, on, on whether any of you think that there is something being dismantled here and that, um, that we have evidence of, of uh, what is dismantled in, in the period after that. So I will stop there um, and, and let us turn to the discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Austin. If the uh, other panelists would care to join us, turn their cameras back on uh, and their microphones, uh, you are welcome to respond uh, if you would like to do so. I'll just quickly respond because Paula did kind of ask a question uh, of me about whether World War I, the suffrage movement was just more legible, or I guess I'd put that as visible, if that corresponds with what you meant. Um, yes, I, I think one could argue that women were probably more visible as after a, a half century of societal development. Uh, but part of my argument would be that Stan and Anthony really lowered visibility during the war. They suspended the women's movement. They campaigned for emancipation instead of women's rights. Um, and it, it doesn't even occur to them to really frame what, they are, what women are doing as war services the same way men are doing. Um, the earliest references where I start seeing, like Mary Livermore saying we did do military service, is 1870. So when black men are getting the vote and women are getting bypassed, that's when they decide, oh, we have to make this claim. Whereas Carrie Chapman Catton never does that. And from the very beginning, she is saying we are doing war service. She encourages women in uh, NASA to do war service. And she's always hitting, she and Helen Gardner, uh, about whom there's, there's been a recent book, always hitting President Wilson over the head with the fact we are doing this war service. So they, they definitely, the women's movement made a, a lot more effort to make it legible in World War I than they did in the Civil War. <laughs> 
Um, well, I, thank you for those comments. They're really terrific. And I think you're asking a really key question about um, how activists don't always challenge uh, categories that they know are working to limit democracy. Um, and one of the things that has really interested me about looking at, at old women and what we now call ageism is the way that um, so many women incorporate this category themselves. And um, one of the ways that older women try to become legible as, you know, respectable, um, you know, not just in an Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham sense, but like worthy of respect at all in any sense as old women is by um, trying to position themselves as not that kind of old woman, right? So they're not the old fools. They're not the old coquettes. You know, they're not in a bit like Robbie is talking about how women were not idiots, you know, or women were not lacking invention, right? So the way these categories actually work, um, even in, in efforts to reconfigure them and that, that um, you know, it does really limit uh, women's ability to actually embrace growing older, you know, and um, in answering this, I'm also addressing Nathaniel Winden. Um, thank you as a question in the Q&A of, you know, were, were women uh, saying that old age was inherently virtuous? And I think not. It's more that they bifurcated bad and good forms of old age um, and uh, tried to put themselves on the good side. <laughs> Right. Uh, but so, you know, they're constantly reinforcing the very hard piece that they're trying to, to take apart. I also uh, like to thank Paula for your great comments and making change is really, really hard. Um, so I don't want to discount the fact that um, having the 19th Amendment is something that was a heavy lift to do. I mean, it took decades uh, for it to happen. And I think really thinking about sort of women as qualified for the vote was something that was pretty significant um, and game changing in terms of our consciousness about citizenship and democracy. At the same time, though, I think that when it comes to sort of liberal rights-based regimes that often what happens in terms of trying to gain rights is that you're saying i am like the people that already have the rights and i am distinguishable from folks that shouldn't have it um so sort of rights sort of prevail on the fact like that there is a wall of exclusion in which some people don't get them um, so that in some ways, can, that sort of use of an analogy can be something that um, has a conservatizing sort of impulse to it. Um, and I think that there are particular categories then that become ones that become sort of the prior groups, right? Like so that we can say that like anti-blackness is one of them. Um, and one of the things that I want to sort of put into the mix is that sort of mental disability is also another one of those where all of these groups were saying, we're not like them. These are the people that really should not have the vote. Um, and we should because of misclassification. But the rubric is one that we agree with. all of these papers overlap so much, um, I'd like to take a few minutes and give you the opportunity to ask questions of each other um, if that's something you'd like to do. Um, certainly there are very clear connections between some of the papers. Um, if anyone has anything, feel free to start. Uh, so that, um, that sort of the woman invented the cotton gin is sort of wild and shocking and everything. Uh, so I was wondering how, did that play into sort of regional politics too, right? That, um, that a woman was responsible for something that was such an important part of sort of Southern industry. Um, so how does it change our idea of like, of, um, of sort of like regional suffrage attempts. And I would think, I mean, I'm just guessing here, I know nothing about intellectual property at all. And I so appreciate what you tell us about it, uh, Kara. Um, do we see more um, patents in 
the East than we do in the West. That is the places that um, didn't really have sort of the vote um, as opposed to sort of Western states. To um, tie together Robbie and Nicole around questions about military veterans, because it is certainly true that veterans are able to claim male vet veterans uh, status as citizens and voters. But uh, Robbie, I think in some of your work, you've looked at sort of older, impoverished and uh, disabled veterans. Like, can they always hang on to that citizenship to the end? Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think that that is one thing that's sort of like an irony when it comes to the use of military service to get uh, enfranchisement because um, one of the parts of the book, and I uh, published this as a standalone piece in Stanford Law Review, is how um, Civil War veterans that were in disabled veterans' homes were disenfranchised because benevolent uh, residents of benevolent charitable establishments were all uh, denied the vote. So the soldiers home proponents tried to, as I said before, sort of tried to distinguish themselves as saying that veterans are different. They're not like people in paupers and poor houses or lunatics and lunatic asylums, but they lost that claim. So the folks that um, actually sort of their bodies were impaired due to their military service were directly the ones that actually did lose the right to vote. Um, and it's sort of a, uh, I think, a flip between sort of what we classically think of citizenship with, uh, say, sort of C.S. Marshall's, I mean, sorry, T.H. Marshall's idea of citizenship where people receive the vote and then they leverage it to receive resources. Um, here, people, the veterans are receiving the resource and because it is a particular type of resource, they lose the right to vote as a result. So yeah, thanks for that pitch, Corey. <laughs> I'm much appreciated. But it's just, Nicole, can you respond to that? Like, is it a particular kind of veteran that's able to claim? Well, I'd, I'd go back to the American Revolution because um, as Stanton pointed out in the post-Civil War period um, and, and various pro-women suffrage people did, there really isn't a, a direct right to vote because you've served in the military or because you are eligible for military service. Because, of course, once men uh, age out of being required to do military service, they don't lose the vote. Uh, and men who, for whatever reason, don't serve, don't lose the vote. So, so Stanton made that argument. But, but one of the arguments that occurred or, or one of the places where um, military service and the vote got connected was in the revolution where men said in a period where the franchise was much more limited, as we know, um, that if I fought in, in the army, if I fought to create this country, I ought to have the right, right to vote. Um, so it, it re there really wasn't this direct one-to-one -one, uh, assumption that service got you the vote, but that becomes sort of more assumed um, over time. Um, and then to pick up what Rabia said about why people, um, about how people, you know, take the vote and then they get themselves uh, more rights. Certainly in the Civil War period, one of the things that African Americans said was, we need the vote to protect ourselves because there are people who have the vote who are out to get us. In fact, they used to own us. And so if you want our freedom to continue, we need the suffrage as, as protection. Excellent, all right. Such a great conversation uh, between the panelists. Thank you, everyone. Let's turn to some questions from the attendees. Uh, this one comes to us from uh, Professor Prieto who presented yesterday. Thanks for the great panel. I wonder whether each of the panelists might say a bit more about how their themes, old women, military service, invention, played out 
after the endpoints of their papers here. I'm thinking especially about the 19 teens, the vibrant last decade of the suffrage movement. I was laughing at that that question because <laughs> that's such a tough question in terms of like talk about the things that you haven't researched or written about. <laughs> I mean, so one thing that I would say is when I was thinking about the book, it was hard to figure out what the end point is, given that the majority of states still disenfranchised on the basis of mental status. And I ended in 1920 because I needed to end at some point uh, to finish this thing. Um, but then also because it was a big uh, change in terms of the 19th Amendment. So in, on my stuff, I would say that um, there isn't much difference in terms of, I mean, I guess like there is, there is something in terms of like this big, uh, social movement uh, changes form a lot. So you don't get as much of like sort of the posters and parades and all of those things. Uh, they sort of mentioned that were um, sort of reinforcing the idea of mental incompetency. But the fact that there was still this group of folks that was disenfranchised, that continues. So over to all of you guys. <laughs> Okay, so I can jump in a bit on that. Um, and thank you, Laura, for the question. Um, I think there really is a profound change around age in the 1910s. And what interests me is that middle-aged, and I actually love Paula's phrase, elder-aged, um, I, I may take that on, uh, women remain active in every faction of the women's suffrage movement. Um, they're radical, they're you know lobbying Congress, they're getting arrested. Um, but the face of the movement becomes so overwhelmingly young in the process propaganda. And I really am trying to argue that that's a shift and that um, black women do this too, but particularly white women um, really give up on trying to convince people that um, older women should be taken seriously as political leaders and they just want to get the vote and they think that they can take care of um, getting elected after. And really it, it it hasn't worked out so well, <laughs> you know, we're um, still really lacking parity in elected office. We still have um, older white men really controlling politics in our country. And um, I'm hoping that there will be a revived interest around issues of age. Um, and I think, I think there will be when we talk about this political moment, I think COVID is uh, drawing attention to precarities that are based on age and the racialization of age in ways that really um, offer the possibility for a new politics around age-based justice movements that may be on the horizon. Go ahead, Nicole. Well, I, I just wanted to say um, I've admired Corinne's work for a long time and it's been, uh, it, it's, it's, it's been an honor to be in this panel with so many distinguished scholars, but I have to say that your, your paper on misogynistic oldest, old age hit way too close to home when I read it. it. It was, there was an ouch moment because as, as I am now at Lucretia Mott's age that you spoke of, it, yes, I, I feel those same vibes um, sort of coming my way. But to come back to this, this question of how it's all playing out today, I think Corinne's exactly right that being an older female politician is different from being an older male politician and probably will be for a while. Um, but I have really felt since I've begun my work looking uh, at suffrage these last several years that it's, it's all too much a replay of the post-reconstruction -re period, uh, that we're entering a new period of disfranchisement. My own beloved home state of Indiana pioneered voter ID laws. And when the state of Indiana argued for our voter ID law in front of the Supreme Court, uh, one of the justices asked, how many people um, 
you know, ha how much of this kind of voter fraud that this law is supposed to prevent do you have in Indiana? And the state of Indiana's response uh, by our attorney general, who is up for re-election this year, uh, was, well, we don't have any of this kind of fraud in Indiana. And then the justice is asked, well, how many people are you going to disfranchise with this law? How many people aren't going to have this ID? And we know that it's primarily elderly and primarily African Americans who are not going to have this kind of ID. And, and I don't remember what the number was, but the state of Indiana had an answer. They knew how many thousands of Hoosiers would not be able to vote. Um, and then since the Supreme Court eliminated the preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, these kind of voter ID, uh, Texas immediately passed one, North Carolina. Um, so, it, and if you go back to the 1890s, why did they institute poll taxes and literacy tests? Well, you couldn't disfranchise people on the basis of their race, so you said, well, we've got all kinds of voter fraud that we need poll taxes and literacy tests to get rid of. So uh, in, in answer to that question about how, how do you see your, your work sort of not in the 1910s, I would say today, it is all very, very, unfortunately, terribly relevant. All right. Well, there are two questions here that are about present day. Um, so um, I'll sort of tie them together, although you've already touched on uh, some of these themes here. Um, amidst these current conversations about voting rights in advance of the 2020 election, do you see a legacy of the themes you study in today's debates? For example, Professor Belt's map of where states continue to limit voting rights based on mental ability was fascinating. And I'm going to tie this with another question that asks about the effort in Florida to enfranchise former felons. Absolutely. So I guess one thing I just want to sort of flag really quickly is that we didn't talk really about partisanship at all, um, but that's a really important part of what's going on now in terms of that we've had this realignment of political interests based on sort of race and gender and class um, in which a lot of that is concentrated in one political party um, and then a lot of the restrictions are coming by the other political party. Um, so when it comes to uh, stuff now, it is really striking. I tell my disability law students that watch the conversation about COVID because we're having a disability conversation that is not being flagged as a disability conversation in which the entire world is thinking about how to change itself based on the vulnerability of our bodies. Um, but because it's not siloed in one particular group of people, then we don't talk about it as a disability issue in terms of things like accommodation. Um, but there are issues now in terms of folks that are within um, sort of congregate care facilities, places like nursing homes, assisted living facilities, that's really hard because they have trouble accessing the ballot in a typical election, but it, particularly now where it's really hard because of COVID for people to be able to get into facilities to get ballots um, to folks. Um, and also that these, we don't really sort of think about all these facilities together. Think about, say, the prison along with, um, say, an assisted living facility um, when disabled folks are cycling through all of them. Um, and I think we still also have respectability as an important component of the vote. So strikingly, we talk about people who have left prison and we are having a discussion about whether or not to enfranchise them. We're behind a lot of the world on this, mind you. Um, but a lot of it is sort of this idea that like you get to reclaim your virtue because you're out of prison. So um, we certainly need to enfranchise the 6 million people that have been in prison, but we don't really talk about the two million people that are in prison and jails, right, and whether or not they should also uh, get the vote like they do in Canada, like they do in Western Europe, that we also lag behind 
on sort of that basis. And distressingly, we still see like a lot of like full throated ableism going on in terms of like painting Biden as senile, sort of like mocking uh, his stuttering, um, sort of things like that. The status of immigrants really uh, flags these proposals that were coming out to undo the 14th Amendment, right? I mean, in this moment where we're connecting uh, reconstruction and women's rights, um, it, you know, it's really stunning to think about actual proposals to undo these amendments that are so foundational, something like birthright citizenship being seen as a problem now. I'll, I'll pick up with what um, Corinne and, and Robbie has said um, about the 14th Amendment, because Rabia's comments made me think about the 14th Amendment, because the second section of the 14th Amendment says that if you have a certain portion of your population that isn't male population that isn't getting the vote, your representation should be reduced. And what I thought of when Rabia was talking about, as we know, the prison population is disproportionately African-American, and uh, disproportionately housed in rural areas where they actually increase. I mean, if you're in a prison in a largely white rural area, you are increasing the representation they get in Congress, but you are disen disenfranchised. Um, so, so that was what, what I thought of. Uh, and then another thing that Robbie has said about partisanship, I'd go back to one of the very early questions that asked uh, in uh, the Civil War Reconstruction period, uh, were congressmen and senators dividing and conquering uh, African Americans and, and women over suffrage. And that was a very partisan phenomenon. The Republicans were generally worried that if they tried to get black male suffrage and female suffrage at the same time, they were not gonna be able to get either. And so they prioritized black male suffrage. Uh, Democrats were the ones who kept introducing, if you wanna enfranchise black men, well, why not these worthy white women, um, as Robbie had talked about, the, uh, who are respectable, um, who are educated, uh, and so Democrats used it as a, a tool to undermine black suffrage. It was a very partisan divide in how they were using the divide and conquer. So I guess my kitten Rosemary also wants to learn about suffrage. <laughs> uh, so I think one thing that's sort of striking about right now too is like that we, given that we are celebrating the anniversary of both the 15th Amendment and also the 19th Amendment, that um, it's been striking how much the 19th Amendment has been foregrounded, perhaps because I think uh, we think of the legacy in a way that seems more like it's celebratory and there's a success. It's like, hooray, white women got the bet. Whereas the 15th Amendment, it's because um, sort of black voting really um, was under siege and sort of folks were disenfranchised afterwards. And then there was a statute the Voting Rights Act that actually did a lot of the work um, later. But then also now we still have sort of black folks that that can't vote. Um, you can't really sort of do that victory celebration success thing when it comes to the 15th Amendment. But I think as folks like Martha Jones have been trying to like sort of um, <laughs> really urge us is that if you're thinking about the 19th Amendment as like this pure success, then you're not thinking intersectionally, right? Um, and that there are so many women that, um, that can't vote now. So um, again, sort of kudos to the Massachusetts Historical Society for putting them together. Um, if I may, I think this picks up on the very important question that Paula asked about the divisions among the act activists. And I think because of the, the shortness of the presentations, we haven't had a lot of time to talk about how uh, black women, uh, women and African Americans were pitted against each other, and uh, white women and black women were pitted against each other uh, with, you know, white women using the racism of, of the period and, and uh, succumbing to it, which I think was a, another question um, 
that, that uh, Paula raised about uh, how with, within the moment you're trying to get a seat at the table and if that means shoving away other people who you think are hindering your path to the table, they did that. Uh, thank you. Very, uh, Paula, did you want to jump in? Well, I think I was only going to jump in to say, I mean, I think it's why I, because I read all of these together, it's why I began, not began, but it, it highlighted for me the question about the problems with the table and, um, and a reminder, right, that, that the work is, a, is about kind of uh, keeping democracy open because it is constantly contract, right, contracting and being contracted by, um, by some folks in power. But I think I, you know, based on kind of the contemporary moment that we're in, I think many people are asking these questions about the table and the problems with the table at, configured as it is. And I, so I'm particularly interested in everybody's work to sort of look at the ways that so many people historically did not question the table and, and, and sort of thinking about those narrow definitions, right, of military service, of, um, of uh, ability, mental ability and the, its relationship to age and, uh, and gender and race. And I think I was very interested in everybody's paper about the role of social and biological sciences and thinking about Right, those disciplines right now, what is the work that those disciplines are doing right now in terms of challenging some of, you know, what we know are the confines of the table the, that we th the, and the way we think about that table. Thank you very much. That was actually, all of this was actually a great segue for tomorrow's uh, panel and also our concluding discussion. So tomorrow is the last day of the uh, panels for this conference. Uh, we start at 1.30 uh, with a panel with two papers on the lost cause and the 15th Amendment and another, pa uh, another paper about women's suffrage and the right to hold public office, which is also not often considered. And then we would like to have a, sort of a discussion, more of a discussion, a roundtable discussion. Uh, we hope you'll be able to join us uh, with uh, Allison Lang and Christian Sumito, who are the co-organizers of this uh, meeting. Uh, and so uh, that will, uh, con this discussion will continue on at that point. We do have individual questions for the panelists. I shall email them uh, after this program uh, and uh, uh, we will um, uh, move along on that front as well. So on behalf of the Massachusetts Historical Society, thank you all so much for sharing your work with us. Professor Austin, thank you for commenting on this. This was such an enlightening conversation. What a great afternoon. And uh, we hope that uh, you and our attendees will be able to join us tomorrow for our concluding program.